Matthew chapter 7. And those filled with the Holy Spirit know the verses already. If you, if, you, if you really have the Holy Ghost, you should know the verses in advance. 24 to 27. 24 to 27. When you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say wait for me. Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the house descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fail, for it had been founded on a rock. But everyone who hears the sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat off on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Praise the name of the Lord. Your perspective in the time of crisis will determine how you come out of it. I'll say that again. Your perspective in the time of crisis would determine how you come out of it. And so some of you heard me make a statement last week. I said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Never let a good storm go to waste. Last week, I started a series of teachings that I titled Lessons Learned from the Pandemic and Lockdowns. Because I believe with all of my heart that every time we go through a crisis or a storm, we need to be able to look and take stock of what we experienced and plan ahead in case it happens again. Last week I said to you, the storms of life will happen. It's not a matter of if, but rather an issue of when. So will you be prepared for it? So the title of my message today, guess what is? Lessons learned during the pandemic and lockdowns, part two. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I thank you for the grace, the anointing to minister your word. I pray, Father, that your presence will be in this room. And I pray for all of those who are joining us live on the internet as well, that there will be grace, grace, grace for everyone to learn, to listen, to be blessed as a result of the preaching of your word today. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Praise the name of the Lord. Please settle down. As a recap, for the benefit of those who may have missed the message last week, I will share with you a little bit of what we learned last week. We talked about a storm and defined it as one that is marked by significant disruptions to normal conditions. And it has the potential to harm lives and property. When you're going through a storm, nobody needs to tell you, you know, because things are going haywire. Anybody ever experienced a time before you felt like all hell is breaking loose? Like, what's going on in my life? Again, we looked at the concept of building on the rock because Jesus, here teaching his disciples, tells them this powerful, powerful truth. He said, the one who builds on the rock, when the storms come and beat the house, the house will remain standing. But if you build on sand, when the storm comes, he said, it will fall. Now, we know a little bit to know that the strength of a building is dependent on the strength of the foundation. So he's talking about building with a rocky foundation with the understanding that the storms will come. Now, it reminds me also of another discussion that Jesus had with his disciples. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. After Jesus had asked the question, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, as usual, blots out, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, well done, Simon. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Then made another statement, said, based on this, on this rock, 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, some denominations religiously had thought that it meant that the church would be built on Peter. But that was not what God was saying. Because, of, of course, the name Peter is from the root word Petros, which also means rock. But what God was saying, or rather what Jesus was saying, was that on the foundation of this truth, this truth about who I am, as the son of the living God, the Christ, the anointed one and the anointing. He said the church will be built on the revelation of this truth and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, when a church is built on the correct truth, yeah. when the storms come, yeah. you will not be blown away. I was having a conversation with a close relative recently and I was saying I learned so much lessons in the last one year. It's not about the size of a congregation. It's not about how much money they have. It's not about all their fees or the fun fair, all of those things. If you really want to know the quality of any church family, take a random sample of the believers there and test them and see how rooted they are in the word. Because the word is the foundation. Now, I remember last week also I was sharing with you some quotes about crisis and the storms of life. I'm only going to repeat one of those quotes. It was the one by Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States of America. He said this, I am a firm believer in people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts. Now, I chose this one because it lines up with the words of Jesus. That when you have truth, you have a foundation you can build on. Even in the time of crisis, if you have the facts and the truth, you would remain strong. And then it dawned on me, no wonder the devil and his agents have another ministry. Apart from stealing, killing, and destroying, they have another ministry, which is the ministry of deception. The Bible says he's a liar and the father of lies. And so now you've got to understand that when crises come up, the most important thing every child of God should do is look for truth. The last one year has been devastating for many people because they didn't know the truth. They didn't know the facts. And as a result, many people have experienced so much Chaos, fear, and challenges in their lives. So I believe the words of Abraham Lincoln that says, if you give people truth. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest. If there was truth about the source of this virus, it started somewhere. It didn't just happen. It didn't come from heaven. Somebody, some people know the truth of how it started. But because they heed the truth, many more people all around the world suffered for it. At least we know one thing. They said it started from a country in the far east, the nation of China. We know it started from the province of Wuhan. We know uh, there's a lot of debate whether it's a lab, whether it's fish bag and stuff like that. Some of us know the truth. But the fact remains, if somebody had been honest enough to say, this is the problem we're experiencing, this is what is going on. How many people agree with me that the rest of the world would have been saved. So truth is important. You're to build your life upon truth. And hence the reason why we need to review some truths from the word of God, from the experience we've had in the one, last one year, so that we can build our lives for the future on it. I shared with you three points last week, and I'm going to quickly run through those points. Number one, Get rid of your fears and make room or make no room for future access. Get rid of your fears. Somebody say, get rid of your fears. Fear is dangerous. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. In other words, when I find fear in myself, I know that God is saying, I didn't give that to you. Son, if you're afraid of anything, just know this. I didn't give it to you. I give you love, power, and a sound mind. You know, wherever you got it from, you didn't get it from me. I also understood by studying the life of Job, the detrimental effect of fear. In Job chapter 3 verse 25, we get a clue where Job said, that thing that I feared the most, said, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. I personally realized that from my teenage to early adulthood till now, most things that I've secretly feared, I've had to deal with. Yeah. At some point in time, what I secretly was afraid of, I had to confront it. 
I tell you, my brothers and sisters, fear is a force. It's a magnetic force just like faith. Faith attracts the positive outcome you want, but fear attracts the negative outcome you don't want. So I've learned to fight that battle. I apply for a contract. I'm believing God that the contract will be approved. And then the enemy whispers in my ear, do you think you're the only one? There's a whole bunch of other people that are trying to get the contract to. Why do you think you're so special? I know I have to go into battle immediately because the moment I become afraid, the moment I become afraid of what could happen, guess what? I begin to attract it. Let's stay focused. Ushers, please help me avoid distractions, please. Number two, build your faith up in God in readiness for future storms. Build your faith up in God in readiness for future storms. Now, I said this. I said the storms will come. Some of us have lived long enough to know that life is not just smooth, 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 smooth. Mm-mm. You have some challenges along the way. But you build yourself up in advance. Listen to the words of King Solomon, the wisest man of his time. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. In the last one year, many of us had had an opportunity. If we want to be honest with ourselves, I had certain things happen that gripped my heart. And I had times when the fear tried to take me out. And I had to learn from others to know how to make sure that I was building my faith and not allowing anything else. Build your faith in advance. If you have to wait for a problem to begin and then you... That's too late. You can't start doing that then. Live a lifestyle of prayer. Have a fasted lifestyle. Have one day a week that you fast every week. Wake up in the morning and pray. Don't let your prayer always be emergency mode in time of need. My child is sick. My child is sick. You're running up and down, shaking up. Why are you shaking? Did you put your trust in God? Do you think you can look after your child? Our children shall be nursed by our side, and great shall be the peace of our children. Psalm 91 tells us, He that dwells in the sacred place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. Have you been building your faith? Have you been quoting it? And I shall say of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress and my... In whom will I trust? Surely He has delivered us from every virus, the one they've concocted and the ones that they're yet to concoct. Say this, Pastor Daniel, is too boastful. Yes, I'm boastful in God. If I cannot boast in this God, then what am I doing here? I might as well go to IT and just do consulting and make money. But I know this God, he's worthy. He said he will even give his angels charge over you to bear you up, lest you dash your foot on the stone. In other words, you can't even look after your own children. You can't watch them in the the playground all day long. And if you have secret fear, that fear will keep manifesting problems until you get rid of it. Let me tell you something. Once the enemy has something on you, he will use it against you. Everything I was afraid of, I had to deal with, including the fact that I I was running away from ministry because I just wanted to be a successful person, just wealthy. I didn't want to have nothing. Pastors I knew were broke, and I just, "Mm -mm, no way. I was scared of lack. Then even worse, there was a time I was totally scared about Ministry running out of resources. Because I also know that the believers sometimes will judge you when they like you, they give. When they don't like you, they take away. And they talk about pastors like pastors are dogs. I, I, I'm so sick and tired of seeing people do that. They just judge and judge and judge and judge. So I said, God, please, anything else but not this. Do you know I had to face every single one of those fears? I told you last week, 2008, while we were pastoring in Medford, I was so scared about the accounts church account running out of money and I kept on seeing like $10,000 at the time was just going until all of a sudden they said the balance. I did everything I could. We stopped our television ministry. We were on Fox five days a week. I had no sense. I got on television. I was doing five days a week from week one. I had to get a permanent member of staff who was doing programs because we didn't have enough broadcast for 22 episodes in a month. So we had to do programs. We had to be the studio inside the church and do so much. We ran out of money. What I feared the most happened. And when the money was out, it was like I heard God say, "Uh uh-huh, so now what are you going to do? So I went back and trusted him again. Trust me, every 
kind of fear that I've had. I've had to face each one and say, God, please help me. Number three thing I shared with you last week was developing the lifestyle of confessing God's word. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. Every one of us will eat of the fruit of what we're saying. So let's train ourselves now. How are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. Every time I hear somebody say, oh, not bad, I tell them, "Mm -mm -mm, come aside, bro, let's talk. (laughs) That not bad is not good enough. This is your opportunity. It's your mouth. Say what you want. Even if the finances are low, I'm still blessed. I don't go by what I see. God has 101 ways that he can bless me before tomorrow. I've seen the faithfulness of God. Some of you guys have heard me share this testimony. How do you have children in a private university in America and be pastoring and not even have a pastor's salary? How do you do that? And then all I had was my consulting company and I had to believe God for contracts and believe God that income would come. And I have to believe God for $41,000 every year. And then the time came, I had two at the same time. How do you do that? Don't tell me I don't know that this God is a provider. I can't even tell you I can calculate or work out what God did. All I can just tell you is when each person graduated, there was no debt to the university. And I know that it is God. The almighty God. Awesome. Incredible. Don't be scared in the middle of the month about your bills at the end of the month. How big is your God? 14 days? God does not even need one day. 14 minutes. It can cost one phone call to change your story. I can't count how many times I would take a step of faith and I would start doing something and I would not have the money. And I would tell my wife, I would say, "Hmm, here I go again. And out of the blue, crazy things, money showing up in bank account because he's that good. Maintain a good confession. Pastor, but you, you had some symptoms of the flu. You would have never heard it in my mouth. I was well and blessed all the time. And sometimes I would have, I would have a go at my wife. Don't call nobody, tell anybody anything about anything. Because honestly, how many people really pray for you anyway? You just advertise yourself and everybody then broadcasts more negative confession over you. I am well. Amen. And I will stand on his word until my life lines up with my confession. Watch what you say, you might just get it. Watch what you say. Watch what you say. I'm learning more and more about the power of confession because God is teaching me more and more about the fact that I've been made in his image and after his likeness. And we are the only ones, the children of God, we're the only ones that can decree a thing and it shall be established. What I can decree, the prime minister cannot. He has to take it to parliament to debate on it. Unless he becomes a child of God. And I don't know, I'm not saying this to judge him. I don't know whether he knows the Lord or not. But I'm just trying to help you understand who you are. Haven't we tested it many times in this church? Remember when the enemy came against him and we used to have prayer meetings and we said it. It slipped out of the mouth of one of us that in seven days time the promise is going to come out of what happened. Remember just a few months ago when they started saying uh, there's a third wave. And the Lord said, son, are you going to keep quiet? You see, I had this thing, you know, all this false humility that we have. You know, I'm just this little binny preacher, this little binny, you know, you have a small church. And God says, just stop all that rubbish. It's false humility. You're my child. What I put in you is what I put in you. And what I ask you to do, you do. And I came up to this pulpit and I said, the same mouth with which the prime minister said there will be a third wave, they're going to one day say there will be no third wave. And the day I saw it a few days ago in the morning prayer at 6 a.m., I told everybody on the prayer, I said, go check the headlines. They said, oh, now we finally avoided the third wave. Then I caught a glimpse again yesterday. Some big mouth was beginning to say, oh, there's something going on in India, we think. And I'm like, in your backyard for members of your... We've had enough. We've had enough for people being sick. No, people think this is a joke. It's witchcraft. I know you guys grew up in England. I grew up in the part of the world where I know the power of the mouth. Witches, wizards, evil people, all they use is this, this thing. 
they invoke the spirit and they release curses. So you let people say things around you that will affect you and you let them get away with it. No. As you are calling the wave, I'm returning it. Not in my life, not in my family, not in my backyard, not for any of our church family. No wave, no wave. Somebody said no third wave. Mm -hmm. Elijah was a man of like passion like you and I. He had the audacity to stand in front of the king and say there will be no rain. Three and a half years, they were looking for him, begging him. A man, James chapter 5, 16, says, he was a man of like passion like us. The king was looking after him. It's time for us to know who we are. Now, let's look at the new points, new lessons that we're going to learn. All of that was the introduction, so pray for me <laughs> for the lesson. I can tell sometimes when the grace of God is on my life, and I, I just feel such a presence of the Lord right now. Number four. Get out of debt and build up savings for future financial crisis. I'm going to give you some practical things today. Get out of debt and build up savings for future financial crisis. Pastor, are you cursing us that there will be financial crisis? In I'm just telling you, I've lived long enough to know that in life, there are seasons of abundance and there's some seasons of not so much abundance. I won't say seasons of lack because I'm, I'm watching. No seasons of lack. How many people will be honest? I have many adults in this room. Put your hand up if you've known that there's some seasons where there's extra and there's some seasons where there's not. So what do you do, child of God? You be wise in the season of extra. You save. Joseph did not go to Pharaoh and say, let's pray in tongues. You know, the famine will not come. It will not come. It will not come. No, Joseph said, Pharaoh, let's go and hide food. Because it's coming. Challenges are coming. As we get more and more to the last days, ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest with ourselves. There's still challenges coming. I know some people might think pastor is being extreme, but let me tell you, the last one year is just a little show. The challenge is coming, but would you be ready? Please get out of debt. Whatever you do, pay it off. Especially now when interest rate is so rubbish, it's so useless, how many people know what interest rates are? I was speaking to a bank manager a few days ago, and I was trying to see if there was something somewhere, just a little change somewhere to move somewhere to have some interest. He said, um, the interest rate is 0 0.05. I thought to myself, I might as well just chop the money and enjoy it. Zero point, when they say 0, 0.0, that is zero. <laughs> Forget putting any number in front of that. If it's 0 0.0, two zeros, it's zero. But here's the problem. I will cancel people and they say, Pastor, oh, my total debt is 9,000 pounds. But you know, I've been putting some savings in ISA. I said, did you check what the interest rate of your ISA is? Oh, I even forgot to check. I said, go and ask your bank what the interest rate of the ISA is. Do you have credit card? Yes, I do. Do you have a bank? Yes, I do. I said, thou art foolish. Thou art foolish. Because really, what are you doing? You might as well just pay off the debt. When you have debt that is 10%, 15% interest rate, why would you say you're putting money in an account for 0.1%? It makes no sense. Please get out of debt. The wise man Solomon in the book of Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7 says that the borrower is servant to the lender. When the Spirit of the Lord showed me the scripture over the weekend, I wrote down in my notes, I said, do not remain a servant. Tap somebody around you and say, do not become or remain a servant. Debt makes us into servants. Can we be honest with ourselves? When you owe money, you lose control of a portion of your life. You can't go where you like when you like. You can't do what you like. Somebody is commanding you, you must work because you must pay off this debt. I'm believing God, total freedom. The one thing that I still have now that I'm saying God must go is a mortgage. I don't want a mortgage. I don't want, I want to be free to serve God. Wherever he says, son, go, I want to go. Whatever he says, do, I want to do. No debt. Somebody say no debt. Get yourself ready because I'm telling you the storms that are coming, all those who are in debt and keep their debt will become slaves and servants to the system. Get out as quickly as possible. Don't pay minimum payment. 
That's a trick from the financial systems to keep you in debt forever. Yeah. Don't do minimum payment. Slap that thing. Put extra. One day, a young man, this guy's Nigerian. He did a video on YouTube, talked about how he paid off his house in eight years. And he's 37 years old. And I looked at myself at my age and I said, I have a mortgage. Look at this young guy. So I sat down and I watched the video. And I learned from him. And he began to talk about all the different things he did to clear the mortgage. And he said, let me show you the calculation. If you put extra 500 towards your mortgage per month, this is how much you can save. Before I finished watching the video, I stopped it. I called my bank immediately. I said, I want to change my payment. They said, oh, but you know, you have a good... I said, yes, I want to. They said, oh, but there's some penalty. I said, I don't care whatever your penalty. I said, I want to pay extra. Is it by force? <laughs> because... I sat down and I said, look at this guy. He's steady something and he's teaching me how to pay off 25-year mortgage in seven, eight years. Do you think I'm foolish? Would I not learn? And immediately begin to put it into practice. How many shoes and bags and clothing? How many things do we pour money into that have no value? Get out of debt. Tell somebody, get out of debt. And then make sure you always have emergency savings. I remember many years ago, my pastor used to teach us every man must have enough for three to six months. Now I'm telling you, I'm now going to be preaching six months minimum. Say, Pastor Daniel, but that's too much. Did you see what happened last year? We thought the lockdown was two weeks, then three weeks, then one month. Do you know how many people have lost their jobs since April last year or May last year that still don't have a job? Kingdom Faith Church, we've been tremendously blessed in this house. We were crying out to God. Anybody remember? 60 days nonstop. We prayed at 6 a.m. We prayed at 6 p.m. No job losses in the whole church. Members were even having promotion. People were getting new contracts. It's not by luck. It's the faithfulness of God. But one thing I've also learned, you never can tell when these things will happen. Have something put aside. I have enough shirt to last me for youngs. I don't, I don't need more. My whole closet is from there to here. That's my entire closet. Did you hear my son say, yep? You don't need that much stuff if you don't have savings. Save. Somebody say save. 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 Because you never know what can happen. This is lessons learned from the pandemic and lockdowns. Please save. Let me take you to the next one. Number five. Build up some income or sources of income independent from big business and big government. Let me repeat that. Build up sources of income independent of big government and big corporate control. Pastor Daniel, what do you mean by that? If you study closely what happened in the last one year, particularly the impact of the globalists, remember there was a real virus, but there were other groups that jumped on it and they said it was a great opportunity. They began to start releasing videos as early as March and April last year. You saw those videos. You saw some of them. I'm not going to mention their names. What were they saying they were going to do? A global economic People thought it was a joke. And that's why I just see when, when people say things like, oh, it's just uh, uh, conspiracy theory. What conspiracy theory? They told you what they were going to do. Yeah. They told you we're going to make businesses fail and we're going to reset the whole economy. Now, one of the ways that that happens is by the big getting bigger and the smaller ones getting crushed. Ladies and gentlemen, when I used to look at Revelation chapter 13 and I would read that in the last days, the devil, his kingdom, and his agent will have control over the world's financial system. Now, none of, you can't argue it. It's already in the book. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. The Bible said the time is going to come when they're going to offer the mark of the beast. And they're going to say in the financial system, it will be that if you do not take this mark, you cannot do what? Buy or sell. I told the people in first service, I said, you see, that was why I was weary. When I started realizing something was being introduced, I won't mention its name. It's a V-letter word because I don't want YouTube to remove my videos anymore. And, and you know, they, they got to the place where once it became, begins, uh, if you don't do it, you can't do this. If you don't take this, you can't do this. 
If you don't take it, you can't travel. Let me tell you something. Once our mind is conditioned to it, we become slaves to that thing. One day you'll be told, if you don't take it, you can't go back to work. If you don't take it, you can't go to the shops. That's when you begin to know that there is control of man creeping up. God gave birth to me, put me into this world as a free human being to enjoy. The day I cannot enjoy this earth as a free man. The Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24. My father owns this place. The day I cannot enjoy the earth and go as I please anymore. What, what are we doing? We enjoy this so much that we will just become slaves to the system. My brothers and sisters, please understand that the devil cannot take over the world financial system unless we have something called centralization. Centralization of power and centralization of control is when you kill the small and you make the big bigger until one big central corporation or government runs everything. One big farmer, one big bank, central bank. See, they, right now they're having major headaches with cryptocurrency because that stuff is decentralized. See, they don't like it. The people who control the financial systems of this world, they hate cryptocurrency. Every article you see where they put it down is because they don't like it. It's decentralized. Nobody can control it. No central bank can control it. The people who are behind the globalist agenda want to make sure it is central. So why am I saying this? Look for sources of income that is outside of what is controlled by a big corporation or a big government. Go back to independence. Pastor Daniel, you know, where are you getting this from? Genesis chapter 2, the first time we hear the mention of work. Adam was not working for a paycheck. Adam was working to take care of what God gave him. Man was never designed by God to be sweating and laboring for salary. We were supposed to use our gift and talent to provide some sort of goods or service for the benefit of mankind. You don't believe me. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Let me show you the next time there was any mention about work. Genesis chapter 4. Verse 20. Listen to this. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillal, she also bore to Bocane, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubokane was Naaman. Now, what did I learn from this? I began to see how work started by man discovering a talent they have. And then they use it to provide something for other people to get the resources. And when this was going on, it used to be that the talent of the father is passed to the children. So if the father was good with animal rearing, was good with animal rearing, looking after animals and multiplying animals, the children learn how to take care of the animals too. So it becomes a family prosperity that goes generation. If the father, like in the case of Jabal, if he was a good craftsman, the children will learn craft. See, in those days, there was no family planning because the more the children, the bigger the corporation. Family planning, nobody does family planning. You have as many children as you can have. It was a different mindset. The more the men a man has, the bigger his farm because he has children who are going to go take care of it. In those days, when things started, it wasn't for covenant children of God to be working as servants and slaving for other people. Go study the book of Genesis very well and see many of those covenant Jews. They owned something. It was the non-covenant people, the non-Jewish people that were servants that worked for them. And that's why till today, you still will not find a Jew anywhere in Western Europe begging bread or in the streets. Because they understood that covenant. But the most important thing I want to tell you is the power of owning independent businesses. Build small businesses yourself. Yeah. I want to encourage everybody in church, try and pursue at least three income streams. Somebody say three. three. Yeah, income stream. You can call it whatever you like. Side hustle, you know, uh, uh, income on the side. Please. Because just imagine for a moment if all of your dependence was on a, the job you have in one corporation. Has anybody learned anything in the last one year that any company can fail? 
Go back to your high street. Remember how those big retail giants used to say, oh, being in Britain, been in Britain since 1896. Trading since 1903. But in the last 12 months, they're gone. So if all of your life is dependent on that, what will happen to you? And I beg you for God's sake, please do not depend on government handout. Don't depend on social security. One day those things will fail. There's only so much money that governments can print. They're printing money out of nothing and telling you here is follow. Even in America, most people don't understand in America, they're minting money out of nothing. The U.S. dollar is no longer backed by gold. It's backed by nothing. They print more and print more and print more and throw it out and throw it out. And for everybody that has your dollar, your dollar is losing value. The same, remember when I was teaching you guys about investment and I told you don't keep money as cash anymore. Put it into something that never loses value. God is not making any more land. Buy land. God is not making any more gold. All the gold on the earth is all the gold there is. That's God's money, by the way, from Genesis till today. Be careful about the systems of man. It's also very important that you remember the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, when he said, do not keep your treasures on the earth. He said, where rust and moth can eat it up. He said, but let your treasures be in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, learn to sow in your heavenly bank account. Make sure you have a kingdom ID number, tight ID, I call it. And don't listen to the foolish people on the internet that tell you don't tithe. They have not tasted and seen the goodness of God. They're just talking their own rubbish. 26 years I've been doing this. Actually, longer. I was tithing before I got married. I've been married for 26 years. Unfailingly. See, I can share testimonies and say God pays school fees of my children and people think, oh, he's lucky. No, 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 I'm not lucky. It's God because I stay faithful. All through pandemic at the beginning, I told members of the church, I said, if you don't want to lose your job, don't break your covenant with God. Don't break your covenant. They are laying people off. You stay with your covenant with God. Nobody can lay you off. If your 10% is touching heaven, if God... And his kingdom is enjoying something from your paycheck every week. Who will back you up? Who will fight for you? Who can take that job away from you? Are you with me? Please make sure you find income sources outside. Find the things that your hand can do. And make something from this. Make something from that. But don't put all your faith in one company. Because God is going to shake Everything that is shakable in these last days. And if you're not careful, you may get shaken with it. Let me give you the next one. Number six. Are you enjoying this so far? Number six. Acquire and maintain alternative sources of life needs. Like water, food, and energy. The Holy Spirit showed me a story in Genesis 26 in the time of famine, in the time of crisis. And I began to notice Isaac. The Bible said Isaac was told, don't follow the Joneses. Everybody's doing this. You know, that's what's popular on BBC. That's what ITV is saying. What's wrong with that, Pastor Daniel? Can you not hear what BBC is I don't live my life by BBC. I live my life by the word of God. I go to God in prayer and he tells me the truth. So I don't need to listen to a lie. Let all men be a liar. Let God. And so God spoke to Isaac and said, don't go to Egypt like all of them. You stay here in Gerar. Now, it does not make sense. Famine is, there's no rain. The land is hard. No crop will go. And God says, stay there. But then a few verses later, we discovered the Bible said, and Isaac sowed in that year and ripped a hundredfold increase. How? Because God gave him the wisdom of an independent irrigation system. You read a bit more and you find out the Bible said Isaac was digging wells. So he was getting water through his own irrigation system and watering his own crop and his crop grew. Now listen to what the enemy did. The Bible said the well he dug, they went and they blocked it. Now you wonder why would they do that? If you want, can't you just come and say, give me some water from your well. Let me enjoy water from your well for my crop. Why are they blocking his well? And the Lord said, that's exactly the same wicked spirit that is on the earth today. Yeah. Some people decided in the last one year, we will block other people's ability to make money as small independent businesses while we grow. 
You think the pharaohs of the 21st century were affected in the last one year? I said it in the first service. They were not affected. Their logistic system was working fine. Everybody was forced to buy stuff from them. And it was delivered same day. While all the companies in the shopping mall were dying, they were boasting of making 100 billion, another 200 billion. Some of the owners of, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not mentioning any names, so you can fill in the blanks. I'm not mentioning any names because one of them might decide to give us money for our miracle center, so I don't want to upset them. But the reality is this. One of them is now worth more than $150 billion. Many of them became what you call century billionaires last year in the pandemic. And then you want me to be believing one lie on BBC. Go and lock yourself up. Don't do anything anymore. Just let your life go dry. Mm -mm. You and your relatives do all of that. I'm going to continue my life. And I, Did we grow in this church during pandemic? Did we stop worshiping God? Not one Sunday that worship did not go to God in this building. Not one since last year. Every worship service, I preach from this pulpit every Sunday. No sickness in our midst. Don't let anybody lie to you. Don't let them lie to you. Let God be true. Let every man be a liar. I want you to listen, my brothers and sisters. You have to make sure you have other forms of meeting life needs. If you have some money, don't buy a home that is just choked up and everywhere is paved. Try and get something with a bit of land. Maybe it's time for us to start building our own boreholes. So the day they say there's no water from the tap. Maybe we need to have a little bit of land and some of us can have our own solar panels and invest in some of the new battery technology. Someone say, oh, Pastor Daniel, yeah, you know, he can talk like that. He's from the third world. Yes, thank you. I know I used to live in the third world and I know I used to live somewhere. When the power goes, we say, Nepa. Um, some people don't know what that means, um, but don't worry. The Holy Spirit will interpret it for you later on. But listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. During this last lockdown, when the storm hit in the state of Texas, did they not experience lack of power supply? A whole week, no power. Let me tell you something. Be prepared. Let us learn lessons from this last pandemic and lockdowns. Anything can happen at any time. Have some battery technology, something charged up that can give you power for a few days. Have some solar panels somewhere. Pastor Daniel, really do we even have a nice pantry? And I think it's time for us to begin to have some long-lasting grains and some tin food. See, these things have been tested. Remember what they did to us last year? It was psychological games. Psychological games. I remember a pastor in Miami, Florida, who told us it was going to happen before it happened. He was reading the playbook of the globalist agenda. He said, look at what they're planning to do. They're going to create a false scarcity of toilet tissue. And they did it. And we were running around in London buying toilet tissue. And there was no scarcity. I mean, think about it. How can there be a scarcity of toilet tissue? Was everybody pooping ten times more than before? What, what did they do to us? They were messing with our minds. And by the way, I bought some too. And I stuck it up in my garage. And one day, a friend of mine challenged me. He said, you should worry about food first before you worry about toilet tissue. Anybody remember when we went to the supermarkets last year and they told us you can't buy more than two packs of pasta. You can only buy a little bit of rice. I said, in England? And there was no shortage. It was created by man. They just messed with our mind. There was no shortage of food. Let me tell you something. If I can get you to focus on what I show you and what I say to you, I will control your mind. Whoever is controlling your mind is the person you listen to. Make sure that this is what you're listening to. I'm just telling you now. I'm telling you, you can't trust anybody out there. Get on your knees and listen to God. Who will not be afraid? I remember that thing was affecting me too. Every day, BBC, death, death. 
every headline would either have the word D-E-A-T-H or the word D-I-E or the word D-I-E-D. Every headline, every day, several times a day. It's natural. You will be afraid. You are hearing death, you're seeing death. You're hearing death, you're seeing death. You're hearing death, you're seeing death. If they tell you that there's scarcity of anything, you will believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, find a way for the future to be able to get those resources independently. I'm trusting God and I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to find out about all the different new energy sources that exist and see the one that I can do. I'm trusting God. One day I'm going to have, one day soon, by the grace of God, I'm going to have a dream home. And my dream house, I'm very determined I must have land. I must have land with it. As a matter of fact, I want to have enough land so I can plant some few things. Oh, pastor is going overboard. All right, don't worry. You just do your thing. I plant some corn on the side, some potatoes, you know, just some survival stuff. See, some of the major players, I'm not mentioning names. The top 10 largest landowners in America today are all owners of tech companies. Why are they buying all these farms? What are they buying these farms for? Go online and go check bunkers that are being built around the world. Yeah. In the United States of America. Yeah. They're building some bunkers now that go seven floors into the ground. Yeah. Who do you think own them? Why are they doing that? I watched a video of one of the bunkers and they said, you know, a three-bedroom apartment under the ground yeah. is about two million. I'm thinking, why would anybody spend two million here? Who is, and the guy said he, he was already sold out before they finished the construction. The people who are controlling things are not affected by what you are affected by. You think they need restaurants? The best chefs work for them in their houses. They don't need it. They can close restaurants down for two years. And they will bombard you with all the lies that you need to grip your life with fear. They don't eat that stuff. As a matter of fact, the last point I was going to give you was to say plan for easier access to close family members and loved ones. Practical. For the first time last year, I experienced a time when even if we wanted to see our parents, we couldn't see them. I never thought that was possible. But you know what I discovered? See, you guys would love my book. It's, it's right now just the final touches for it to go to print. I know by the grace of God it's going to be ready at the end of the month. I, I'm praying that we can release it at our anniversary on the 30th of May. Pharaohs, prophets, and plagues. God opened my eyes and showed me things that I, I know I've lost a few friends and I've lost some followers who just think this guy is just being so radical. Why is he being so boastful about God and why won't he wear a mask? <sighs> the devil is a liar. I discovered <laughs> that the pharaohs of the 21st century, they are not affected by any of these things that they created. You think they wear masks in their own private jets? Or you think they wear it at home? These guys buy homes. And they will buy up all the houses all around them. They will just buy it just to make sure there's nobody living there. They buy islands. Now, I'm not calling him a pharaoh, but one of the ones I like, you know, this gentleman by the name Richard Branson, he has an island. Do you think COVID got to his island? Who would take it there? All employees will be totally whatever needs to be done to them. You've got to understand what I'm trying to say. They don't need restaurants like you need restaurants. They don't need to get on commercial airline and be, be oxygen deprived. They don't need all of that stuff. They don't. Because they have a life that is outside of the whole system. Now you plan also. Because I'm telling you, you've got to begin to think about it. I got a little window of opportunity in October, and at the cost of flight tickets was ridiculous. And I had to do so many things, you know, negative tests, all of those things, just to be able to just see parents. You know, I went, I saw my mother-in-law, I saw my biological mom, I saw my biological dad, just to see them. Particularly my biological parents, I spent time to just sit down with each of them to say, you know, what do you want? Here's... Tape, let me record. Tell, tell us what you want. What do you want for the rest of your days? How do you want to be? 
You can do whatever, you can make whatever decision, you know, we can't control our folks. They do their own thing and say their own thing. But I just said, this is just the opportunity. I don't know when this kind of stuff will happen again. That occasion maybe was four or five months that I could not get on the plane if I wanted to. What if the next time this happens, we can't get on any plane? And let me tell you things like independence. All the adults that don't drive, get your act together. Get your act together. Now, I really need you to hear this because you never know what's coming. You need to be able to have your freedom to be able to go places. Did you notice what happened to the cost of cars in the last one year? Did you see how car, car costs went up? I remember when I was trying to get a car for my daughter, and the same person that helped me look for a car when my son was getting his first car, the guy said, oh, he can't get anything with that money. I said, but that's how much I gave you for Jeremiah's car. He said, no. He said, don't you know what has happened? Because when the time came that nobody was trusting public transport, nobody wanted to get in a bus, they didn't want to get in a, you know, some people believe that coronavirus was just everywhere, going everywhere around them. So they would not come into a bus. They would not come. Everybody began to drive. And even people in England, one of the best transportation systems, most people don't need to drive. Everybody got a car. What if in the future there's a rule that says you can't have more than one person in one car? For those of you who just think, oh, no, I don't want to bother learning how to drive, you better learn how to drive and have your independence. Oh, pastor, that's extreme. How can they say you can't have more than one? Did any of you ever think a time will come when you'll be told you could not have your family member in the house? Did anybody daydream about it? That a time will come when somebody would say you can only have two family members and then next month you will have three and then next month. So don't be shocked if it happens and they say you can't be more than two people in a car. I've seen some crazy stuff in London. Somebody's in the car all by themselves. Their window is up, they have air conditioning, and they have masks. I'm like, what did they do to us? What did they, you're in the car by yourself. By yourself, with air conditioning. Now, I know it sounds like I'm making fun of this, but you know something? I studied science. And I studied heavily last year to understand. And I went to listen to all the sides of the argument. And I'll never forget the day I saw some consultant virologists with over 40 years experience that said this is craziness. God created the human body with an ability to fight virus on a regular basis. If you do this thing that they're telling you to do, they said it. They said by November, all of you are going to get the flu because your immune system will be weakened. Say, because you're not touching virus regularly, you're not touching bacteria, and your body is not working the way it's supposed to. And I can say that because it's science. And now the scientists have proven all of those things that they told us to do. They were rubbish. Two meters social distancing is not science. It's an airborne disease. I remember one of the, one of the professors, the professor said, so does he jump six feet? The only way this thing was proven to have spread was indoors with close association. And the Holy Spirit said to me, son, it's the same thing. That's exactly how normal flu spreads. When you catch a flu, somebody in the house, I just heard somebody say, yes, she's a pharmacist. She's, she's in, I'm not going to tell you where the person is. But, you know, I thought to myself, what happened to us? The scientists have said it now. They said the whole social distancing was a hoax. There's no scientific finding. They said the, the thing that some of them based it on was something from, I can't remember how many years, many, many, not even decades, I think more than a century ago. And they said even that was just an hypothesis and a theory. It was not confirmed. Guess what else has come out again from one, years of study, one year of study? Coronavirus is not transmitted on surfaces. After one year of study, they've discovered that it's not surfaces. It takes faith to enter a place and rub chemical on your hand that you don't know what it is. It takes faith. What if that thing you rub on your hand burns your hands? Did you go to the shop with them to buy it? Did you look at the content of the bottle? I I'm telling you, I know I sound a bit extreme, but let's, let's just leave all this stuff alone. I don't want to lose anybody tonight. <laughs> Someone say, for Daniel, so I'm fired up because I don't like being cheated. And I don't like being lied to. And I don't like deception. It's one of the reasons why I'm a minister. I love the truth of God's word. I don't like to see 
people pull a wool over my eyes. Truth is truth. And remember what we said at the beginning, if you have the truth, it will help you. Some people might need to consider having some family members relocate or whatever you need to do. But just plan for the future that you will not be cut out, that you will not be able to see your loved ones for extended periods of time. The suicide rate in the United Kingdom was on an all-time high last year. They didn't want you to know that. The suicide rate was so high, many people were getting depressed, and during the lockdowns, it was unbearable. I told you, more people died of other causes than the virus. But that data is not published. Domestic violence was an all-time high in the United Kingdom. Because people were just beating each other to stoop <laughs> on. Those, those who have not, never really liked being at home with each other, they, they started fighting. Even child abuse, and this is not funny now. A lot of children, by the time they were released to come to school for the first time, there was a lot of reports. Because God did not create human beings to exist like that. I saw some craziness just about a week ago. They told kids in a particular liberal state to do sports and to run 800 meters wearing masks. Man, I just wish I could be an angel. Just whoever made that rule, just get that person, strip their bottom and flog them. And one, 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 of the, one of the kids collapsed. The child collapsed. And the doctor was mad. He said, this is oxygen deprivation. What craziness is this? Nobody's running next to her. Why tell her wear a mask and not get oxygen? And the mask is saturated with both oxygen and carbon dioxide. I did science. You've got both oxygen and carbon dioxide mixing in the same place, so now you can't even get your pure oxygen anymore. I breathe in. Ah, oh, thank you, breathe out. God gave me oxygen. No man is taking it away from me. Okay, Pastor Daniel, you're too radical. Now you need to just stop. Let's rise up. I need to just stop. I end with this. Psalm 34, verse 8. All taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Amen. And three questions that I heard the Spirit of the Lord put on my heart. He said, what if the systems of provisions and protection of man fails? What would you do? What if pharmaceutical companies cannot produce vaccine for the next thing that comes what would you do i'm training myself now to have faith in god rather than faith in man what if they can't produce it i told you before if i was the devil after the last one year i would give you a fresh virus every year every year you'll be looking for new vaccine if i was i'm not the devil but if i was the devil and i want to be wicked i will cause the whole world to be in pandemonium every year i'll be releasing new virus but we, the children of God, know that our God is greater. Yeah. Our God is bigger. We have been through one year. Let's learn some things from it. I want us all to be better. I know I can sound really radical. This is not to offend anybody. This is not to make you feel bad. You know, we all went through it. We all had different fears and different challenges. But it's time to take your life back. Yes. My assignment is not to repeat BBC. My assignment is to preach the word of God. Yeah. And the last thing I want to say to you, the Bible says, woe to the one who puts his trust Amen. in man. If you don't take your freedom back, you will never get it. Yeah. We're going to have to take our freedom back yeah. by faith. Daniel, why are you doing that? Don't you know I'm taking my freedom back by faith? Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. I want you to just take a moment to talk to God. Whatever applies to you, maybe you need to get out of debt. Ask the Lord, I need your help. Maybe the debt is more than what you can handle with your salary. Ask the Lord, Please help me. Maybe you're one under the sound of my voice and you don't have any savings. And it just affects you just hearing Pastor Daniel say six months worth of upkeep in savings. Please call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Maybe you're somebody that all you've known to do is just work a job. You don't know how to be able to use your hands to do something. 
ladies, whether you can paint nails, whether you can do hair for other people, whatever you can do, we're still praying. Please, I want us to respect the atmosphere. Please begin to talk to the Lord. Please begin to talk to the Lord. Ask the Lord, Lord, open my eyes. Show me what I have. Is there something that I can earn a living with that is not dependent on, a, on the government or a big company I work for? Lord, I pray for new streams of income, additional streams of income. Please talk to the Lord. Tell the Lord, Lord, show me what am I passionate about that I can use to make a difference. Somebody pray, Father, please, I've been renting for so long. I want to own a property too. Lord, bless me with property. Someone under the sound of my voice, there's inheritance that belongs to you and has been held down. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that the conviction of the Holy Ghost will come upon those who are holding on to what does not belong to them. And they will lose it that you may possess your possession in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Please pray. If you need family reunification, if you're believing God for certain things, for some of us, we have family members, maybe we want them to come to England or, or whatever we need to do, just pray. Lord, prepare me. Maybe it's not even something Pastor Daniel has talked about today, but you, you know that it really affected you during the last lockdown. Father, help me. And finally, I want you to also pray. I told you, I already confessed to you, I've experienced fear in so many areas of my life. But I've learned that fear is not good. And God keeps warning me, get rid of it, get rid of it. Shadrach, Misha, and Abednego trusted me even when there was fire in front of them. Daniel trusted me even at a lion's den. Daniel, my son, trust me. Get rid of fear. Get rid of fear. I just want you to take a moment again to just pray. Maybe there's any fear anywhere you may not know. Any area of your life, the fear something is going to happen to your spouse, the devil would use it against you. He will keep using it. Every time your spouse coughs, you will have high blood pressure. The fear something is going to happen to a child, he will use it against you. He would, it would devour you financially because of that fear. The fear of losing my job, the fear of losing my business. The fear, oh, maybe I'm not going to get married. Whatever the fear is, the fear if I start the business, it will not work. What if your business works? Just ask the Lord again this morning. Lord, take away the fear. For those of you who are joining us from home, join us, talk to the Lord, call upon his name. He can hear you where you are. Ask him to help you in Jesus' mighty name. And finally, before we end this service, I want to give you an opportunity if you do not yet know Jesus Christ of Nazareth as Lord and Savior. I can talk like this only because of one reason. I put my life in his hands. I put my confidence in Him. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. But first, I want to check if there's anybody in this room that either you're asking Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life for the first time, or you feel like you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Just put your hand up very quickly. Just wave that hand. Let me just see so I can pray with you very quickly. God bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else? God bless you. I see that hand. Just keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up, keep it up. Very simple prayer. For those of you who are watching from wherever you are in the world, just repeat the simple prayer after me. Just say, God Almighty, I humble myself before you and I confess my sins that I've been a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I choose to believe that you gave your son Jesus to die on the cross to save my soul. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I give my life to you. Be my Lord. Be my Redeemer. Holy Spirit of God, please come and fill me and lead me and guide me and teach me from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. And for the one that has prayed that prayer, Pastor Tiff, I hope you've seen the hands up. And I pray for those of you who are also watching us from home. May the hand of the Lord come upon you. May this prayer you've just prayed be made manifest in your heart, in your life. May the grace of God Almighty 
become sufficient from you from this moment onwards. I pray that the Lord will lead you and guide you to a Bible-believing church where you will go to and begin to learn about Him and you will grow in Him. I pray that very soon you would know Him. You'll be able to put your trust in Him more than ever before and be able to boast in His goodness in the name of Jesus Christ. And church family, I decree and declare over you God's protection. The same blood of Jesus that has kept us up till now. I remember for many years of my life, they say, don't boast about God keeping you from sickness. I said, God, you have not failed. You will not fail us. God will not fail you in the name of Jesus. God will not fail any of us. We will not know death. We will not know sickness. We will not know lack. We will not know adversity in the name of Jesus Christ. The grace of God will continue to be sufficient for us. His strength will be made perfect in our weakness in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that the God that kept us in this last one year, He will continue to keep us. The Bible says the one who keeps Israel, He does not sleep, neither does He slumber. Our God does not sleep. He watches over us at all times. I pray that His hand will be upon you. I pray it is time. Lockdown is over. Lockdown is over. Now go forward in your life. Make progress. Succeed. Be blessed. Establish. Increase. Be enlarged in the name of Jesus Christ. And with every lesson that the Lord has taught you, even beyond what Pastor Daniel has preached today, I pray for the grace to appropriate them so that your life will be stronger, richer, better than ever before. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.